Okay, this is page I1. Now, section I is my description of the uh, muscle groups of the body. The majority of muscles that we're going to talk about, the good news is we'll be able to see them on the cat. You might say, why is that good news? Because that helps us learn. <coughs> But there are some muscles that we're going to ask you to still be familiar with that uh, we're not going to see on the cat. And among those are the muscles of the face. The cat doesn't have the range of facial muscles that we as humans have. Now, uh, these fa facial muscles are a little bit uh, interesting. They usually originate on a bone, but they insert or attach onto the skin. Now, what a muscle inserts on is what it pulls. So, for example, if the biceps brachii muscle uh, inserts on the radius, it originates on the scapula and inserts on the radius, it pulls the radius of the forearm closer to the scapula. So, all that a muscle does, we've learned, when it contracts, which means to shorten, is it pulls the insertion towards the origin. So most muscles, they originate on a bone, they insert on a bone, and they pull one bone closer to another bone. But these facial muscles originate on bones, but insert on skin. That means they pull on the skin. And uh, these uh, facial muscles are very important in what is known as nonverbal communication. Now you might say, what's nonverbal communication? I'll give you an example. So if, uh, if when I arrive home every uh, day, all I have to do is look at the exp facial expression of my wife, and I know whether I'm in trouble or not. <laughs> all right? She doesn't have to say anything. So that's called nonverbal communication. So we, we communicate with these facial muscles. So we wrote here uh, that uh, all of these uh, muscles of the face are superficial, cutaneous, that means they uh, uh, are associated with the skin. They insert on the skin. Now, we're not going to get into all the embryologic development of muscles. I know you would love me to cover that, but, uh, or not. Technically, the facial muscles actually develop from what are called branchial structures. The word branchial, and again, I'm not testing you on this, actually are related to gill structures. So what uh, become uh, structures associated with gills and fish develop into these facial muscles in us. But I put that in parentheses. I'm not going to test you on it. Furthermore, all of these facial muscles are innervated. And we've learned that word innervate. It means to provide a nerve supply. They are supplied by the facial nerve, also known as cranial nerve number seven. Now, when we were learning the bones, we occasionally would mention uh, that going through the optic canal or optic foramen was the optic nerve, number two. And going through the foramen rotundum was a branch of the trigeminal nerve, number five. All right, so I'm going to be mentioning some nerves here. We will eventually hold you responsible for all these cranial nerves near the uh, end of this course, but uh, try to learn what you can now. It'll just reduce your burden of what you'll have to learn near the end. And, Incidentally, are people more, less stressed or more stressed near the end of a course? More. more. So it's always good uh, to try to learn this now. But this is certainly pretty easy to remember that the muscles of the face are controlled by a nerve called the facial nerve. Now, uh, there are many facial muscles. We're just going to mention a few. So right down here, the first uh, muscle we'll mention is the frontalis. We wrote that it originates on the frontal bone, so it's called the frontalis. It inserts on the skin of the eyebrows. Basically, it's this muscle right here, this muscle right here. We'll see a better picture in a moment. Now, again, let's remember how muscles work. We've got a muscle, it originates on the frontal bone, it inserts on the skin of your eyebrows. What does every muscle do when it shortens? It pulls the insertion towards the origin. So what's it going to do? It's going to raise your eyebrows up, upwards towards your upper forehead. So this muscle, the frontalis, uh, raises your eyebrows, and in the process, it wrinkles your forehead. This is, uh, you might say, well, when do we do that? Well, we do that like when we're, uh, when we're surprised, <gasps> right? So sometimes when we're surprised, our eyebrows are raised. Uh, sometimes we wrinkle our forehead when we're very concerned or worried right? Nonverbal communication. 
Uh, if you are uh, Dwayne Johnson, formerly known as The Rock, so he became famous when he was a wrestler, not for raising both eyebrows, but just raising one of them, if you remember. Incidentally, some of us can raise just one eyebrow. We can alternate. I think I can kind of do that. Uh, but some of us can't. It's genetic whether you can raise both eyebrows or not. It just has to do with that neural innervation and so on. Uh, yeah, and it's, since somebody mentioned Botox, yeah, so what Botox is is you get injections into this frontalis muscle, preventing it from contracting. So if it can't contract, that gets rid of the wrinkling of the forehead. Now, do, do, when you get a Botox injection, does that last forever? No. no, only a matter of months, and then you have to do it again. So it actually temporarily paralyzes the muscle is what it does. All right, uh, another uh, facial muscle is the orbicularis oculi. Orbicularis is called that because it's circular in shape, like an orbit, uh, like a planet orbits around the sun. Oculi means eye. It originates in the orbit Orbit is the eye socket, and it inserts on the uh, eyelids. And what it does when it contracts is it closes the eyelids. So as I wrote here, it's used for squinting, blinking, and winking. You know the difference between these? Uh, if you're driving into the bright sun, so we tend to squint to reduce the glare, the amount of sun coming in. We kind of narrow, close our eyelids most of the way, but not completely. You know the difference between a blink and a wink? Blinking is both eyes. Somebody's blinking, like sometimes when they're nervous. Uh, and winking is just using one eye. You go, you wink at somebody, right? Guy, you winks at a girl, he goes, hey, baby. <laughs> right, wink, winks at you. All right, so that's the orbicularis oculi. It's uh, right here, right? This circular shaped muscle, uh, right, right there. Uh, okay, a third muscle. Uh, is the orbicularis oris. It is circular in shape. Oral means mouth. It originates around the uh, mouth on the maxilla and the mandible, and it inserts on the lips. Remember, all these muscles are kind of inserting on the skin. It puckers the lips, and so that's used for kissing. The orbicularis oris is the kissing muscle. Uh, incidentally, another name for kissing is osculate. So if somebody says, uh, hey, how'd you like to osculate? You might, you know, don't think that they're asking for something else. <laughs> All right, uh, osculate's an English word. It's an English dictionary, it means to kiss. So the orbicularis oris is this muscle right here. Uh, another muscle, the buccinator. What does buckle mean? Uh, cheek. cheek. So we have learned buckle means cheek. You'd say when, page A6. And uh, this is a muscle that uh, originates uh, on the maxilla and mandible towards the back of the uh, cheek. It inserts on the cheek, and it's used uh, for blowing and sucking, especially for blowing, but to some lesser extent, sucking. It, uh, it uh, compresses the cheeks. When you contract it, it tightens the cheeks. So if you have your cheeks inflated, it <laughs> A buccinator literally means to a trumpeter, right? Because a trumpet player <laughs> blows air out through their uh, mouth uh, into the trumpet. So uh, just remember you should blow when you're supposed to blow and suck when you're supposed to suck. Don't blow when you should be sucking and don't suck when you should be blowing. And don't really ask me what that means. Okay, the, uh, the zygomaticus. The zygomaticus sounds like it might have something to do with the zygomatic or cheekbone. It originates on the zygomatic or cheekbone, and it inserts right at the corners of the mouth. So all that a muscle does, we're trying to drive this home, is it pulls the insertion towards the origin. So it's going to pull the corners of your mouth upwards. This is the smiling muscle. When you smile, you pull the corners of your mouth upwards. And that's the zygomaticus. Take a look at page I3. And uh, on I3. Now, since we can't test you on these muscles on the cat, so therefore, I would test you on these muscles on the lecture exam, not on the lab exam. You should know this picture. So here is the uh, 
frontalis. It's also known as the epicranius, but I figure frontalis is easier to remember than epicranius. Here's the orbicularis oculi, the uh, orbicularis oris. Here is the zygomaticus going from the zygomatic arch of the zygomatic bone and inserting on the corner of the mouth. The uh, buccinator is uh, right in here on the side of the cheek. Uh, and uh, some of these other muscles we haven't gotten to yet, we're going to. If you look on the previous page, I2, it has um, a different facial expression. But the ones that I've uh, circled, you should know. So uh, number one, and the key to this, the legend is on the right. Uh, notice the wrinkled forehead, that's the frontalis and the raised eyebrows. Number three, you don't have to know number two. Number three, what's he doing? He's winking at somebody. Uh, that's the obecularis oculi. Uh, number five, he's smiling. That's the zygomaticus. Number seven, uh, he's kissing, uh, puckering. Uh, that's the orbicularis oris. And number 10, with the <laughs> inflated cheeks, he's blowing. That's the buccinator. They uh, use these kind of facial images. Uh, they use uh, other images somewhat similar to this to, so that a patient uh, can point to the image to indicate their level of pain. If somebody either cannot speak and they want to communicate what level of pain they're feeling, or maybe they don't speak uh, English, so then you can point to uh, a, an image, not necessarily these, but uh, fa showing facial expressions that uh, are kind of universal, international images to indicate the level of severity of pain, if, you, if that's the only way to communicate it. Uh, another muscle, uh, facial muscle, is the platysma. Uh, the root platy means flat, plata, flat, another word for plate, it's flatware. Uh, and uh, it originates on the chest. Uh, it inserts on the mandible. So in this case, this one actually originates on the skin and inserts on the bone. But uh, when it, because it, uh, what a muscle pulls on is what it inserts on, uh, it pulls your mandible down. It doesn't have to be very strong to pull your mandible down because gravity would tend to pull it down. So it's, uh, even though uh, it's a pretty large muscle, you can see it on I3, this is the platysma. It's a very thin muscle, but quite broad, but uh, it doesn't have to be very strong to pull your uh, jaw or mandible down. Back on page I2, uh, I now want to mention a few muscles of the eye. Uh, there's actually six major muscles that move each eyeball. And I'm only going to ask you to know four of the six. They all originate in the eye socket or orbit. They insert on the sclera. What does sclera mean? Hard. You'd say, well, we never learned that. Yes, we did. Sclerotome. Did we tell you what sclerotome, sclero means? I gave the example of the word arteriosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. So it means hard. The sclera, or hard part of the eyeball, uh, is the outer eyeball that's uh, white here. And if you'll notice it shows a muscle, and this muscle is originating in the eye socket, and it's inserting or attaching to this hard outer part. Oops, there goes the muscle called the sclera. These muscles move the uh, eye. I am not going to test you on their embryologic origin that they developed from occipital somites. Uh, as I said, there are actually six muscles that move each eye, but we're only going to ask you to know four. The superior rectus, the inferior rectus, the medial rectus, and the lateral rectus, which raises the question, what does the word rectus mean? Rectus means straight. And we're going to see that word over and over. It means straight. So the superior rectus is a straight muscle that inserts on the top of the uh, eye. This is the superior rectus right here on top. And uh, when it contracts, it rotates your eyes upwards. So when you raise your eyes towards the ceiling, now you do not need to turn your head. You can keep your head forward and rotate your eyes so that you're looking at the ceiling. So you just rotated your eyes using the superior rectus. 
The antagonist of that, remember an antagonist is the muscle that has the opposite action, is the inferior rectus, which attaches, inserts on the bottom of the eyeball, and rotates your eyeball down. So we can alternately raise our eyes, lift our eyes up, or rotate our eyes downwards. Uh, there is also a medial rectus and a lateral rectus. The medial rectus rotates uh, the eye medially towards the midline. The lateral rectus rotates it outwards, laterally. So they are an antagonist of each other. Now there are, in addition, two muscles that run at a diagonal. They're called, uh, called oblique. There's really a superior oblique and an inferior oblique. They're listed here. And they have turned the eyeball in a kind of ang angular way, a diagonal way. But I'm not going to ask you to know this. So this is a side view of uh, the eye. Here's the superior rectus. Here is the lateral rectus. Here is the inferior rectus. That's what you can see on that picture. On uh, page I3, on uh, I3, so the next thing that's listed is muscles of mastication. Anybody know what, we have not learned it, but anybody know what mastication means? Chewing. 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 To masticate means to chew. Now again, I'm not going to test you on their embryologic origin. They also develop from branchial or gill structures <coughs> in the embryo. They are all controlled, activated by the trigeminal nerve. Now we had mentioned that the trigeminal nerve is the most important nerve in dentistry. That's the, it's branches of the trigeminal nerve that are numbed when they give a, a lidocaine, a local anesthetic injection into the mouth to numb the sensory part of the trigeminal nerve so you don't feel the pain when they're drilling and so on. But the uh, trigeminal nerve also contains motor neurons, somatic motor neurons that permit voluntary control of your chewing muscles. But we're just going to mention two of the chewing muscles, the temporalis and the masseter. Uh, the more important of the two, I'll start with the more important one, is called the masseter, which literally means the chewer. It's the very powerful muscle for mastication. It uh, originates on the zygomatic arch it inserts on the mandible. And you can see a nice picture of it right here. It, it's originating on the zygomatic bone or arch. It inserts on the mandible. And what does every muscle do when it contracts, when it shortens? It pulls the insertion closer to the origin. So this raises the mandible up. So if your mandible is down, uh, it raises it. It closes your mouth. Now this is a very powerful muscle. It runs right over the TMJ. It crosses right over the angle of the jaw, the temporal mandibular joint. So let's clench our teeth and feel, clench your teeth like this and feel, you'll feel the tension of that muscle crossing right over the temporal mandibular joint. You feel that? It's a very strong muscle. Uh, if you're a future dentist or dental hygienist, you do not want to have your fingers in a patient's mouth when they close that jaw. Because not only are the, you have the strongest parts of the body, the teeth that are going to come in on your finger, that is a very strong muscle. It creates tremendous force. Uh, what we can also learn a, uh, a, a lesson from this, uh, an ethical lesson. Uh, it takes more effort to close your mouth than it does to open it. Okay, we said the platysma, which opens the mouth, is a weak muscle. Gravity will open it, but it takes a powerful muscle to close that mouth. But uh, anyhow, uh, so that the uh, the master. Now, some animals uh, like pit bulls and rottweilers have extremely strong masseter muscles. So when they take a bite on somebody, they can lock their jaw like a vice grip. And uh, sometimes when they bite the, uh, you know, somebody, they don't let go. And they've had to shoot the dog because it just won't let go when it makes that bite. Now there is a weaker muscle that also raises or elevates the uh, mandible, closes the jaw. That's the temporalis. Good name. It originates on the bone, of the skull bone on the side of your head called the temporal bone, inserts on the mandible 
pulls the mandible upwards. If you place your fingers above your ear and move your jaw up and down, you probably will feel something moving above your ear. You feel something moving above your ear? That's the temporalis uh, contracting and relaxing. The upper picture also shows these muscles. Here is the temporalis originating on the temporal bone, and this is the powerful masseter going right over the TMJ, the angle of the jaw, running from the zygomatic bone to the mandible. So on the next page on I4, uh, here's just another picture of the uh, masseter muscle. And this, incidentally, right here is the buccinator mm -hmm. that uh, is used for blowing and sucking. Let's speak briefly about muscles of the tongue. Again, I am not, not going to test you on the uh, embryology part. All of these tongue muscles are controlled or innervated by what's called the hypoglossal nerve. So again, uh, it would be useful to try to start learning these nerve names of nerves. The root glossal means tongue. Hypo means under. It runs right along the underside of the tongue. And it uh, controls, activates the tongue muscles. Now, in terms of the tongue muscles, there are both intrinsic muscles of the trough tongue and extrinsic muscles. So let me explain this word intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic means they are inside that structure. So intrinsic muscles are muscles inside your tongue that move your tongue. We're also going to see that there's some muscles outside your tongue that move your tongue. They're called extrinsic muscles. Now the intrinsic muscles in the tongue run in all three dimensions of space. We have intrinsic muscles inside the tongue. I don't know if anybody has ever eaten tongue. Many people, the very thought of it, it grosses them out. It's actually quite delicious, but, uh, but it is a little gross. Uh, it's really, it's a meat. It's meat. It's muscle. So uh, there are muscles running longitudinally lengthwise from front to back. There are muscles running vertically in the tongue up and down. And their muscle fibers are muscles running transversely. The word transverse, we've learned, means horizontal. You'd say, when did we ever learn the word transverse? Transverse process of the vertebra that it sticks out horizontally. So there are muscles running horizontally, transversely, from side to side. So we've got muscles running in the x-axis of space, the y-axis, and the z-axis. So therefore, uh, the muscle, tongue muscles allow us to do, move our tongue in more different ways than any other muscular structure in our body. So part of your assignment between today, Wednesday, and next Monday is to figure out all the things you can do with your tongue. All right, so just you know, talk to somebody you'd like to meet. Say, but my anatomy teacher gave me an assignment. I have to work on my tongue. I have to figure out what my tongue can do. Will you help me? All right, so I think I'm going to get in trouble here. OK, so uh, anyhow, we can move our tongue. We, many people can roll their tongues into a U shape. You can roll your tongue under or over. Now again, whether one can do all the different movements are partly genetically determined, whether you can roll your tongue in certain ways. Uh, on uh, I-5, in addition, in addition to the intrinsic muscles inside the tongue, there are extrinsic muscles. Now, the extrinsic muscles of the tongue originate, their origin is outside the tongue, but the muscle inserts on the tongue. And what a muscle inserts on is what it pulls, what it moves. So we're just going to give you two uh, extrinsic muscles of the tongue to know, the genioglossus and the styloglossus. What did we say glossal means? Tongue. The genioglossus originates on the inside uh, boundary uh, border, inside border of the uh, mandible, inserts on the uh, underside of the tongue, and it actually sticks the tongue out. It sticks the tongue out. The way it works is it sticks the tongue out 
The word we use for to stick out is protract, to protract or protrude. There it is, protracts the tongue. The antagonist of that is the styloglossus. It's called styloglossus because it originates on the styloid process of the temporal bone. And it inserts on the tongue, and it pulls the tongue back into your mouth. It retracts it. Retracts the tongue. So uh, you can alternately practice sticking your tongue out and retracting your tongue in. Uh, I think it's really useful to learn muscles as antagonists. To learn that the, uh, you have a superior rectus that rotates your eye up and an inferior rectus that rotates your eye down. To learn that we have the platysma that lowers your jaw and a masseter that raises your jaw. That we have a genioglossus that sticks your tongue out and a styloglossus that brings your tongue in. Because that's how we use muscles. We alternately use one muscle and then we use the other. We don't stick our tongue out and walk around for the rest of our life with our tongue sticking out. Uh, and we uh, don't just pull our tongue in and never stick it out. We do both. That's how we use muscles. The uh, next thing on page uh, I-5 is muscles of the pharynx. Now, the word pharynx means throat. Uh, these throat muscles also develop from the gill or branchial arches. Again, I'm not going to test you on that. I put it in parentheses. The uh, muscles of the throat are innervated or controlled by the glossopharyngeal nerve. And from its name of this cranial nerve, number nine, uh, it, it, the glosso means tongue and pharyngeal means throat, the tongue-throat nerve. So it must have something to do with the tongue. Now you'd say, well, what? You already told us that uh, the hypoglossal controls the tongue. There are other aspects to the tongue, including the sense of taste from the tongue. And so the sense of taste is communicated by the glossopharyngeal nerve, at least in part. But uh, anyhow, it's, it ends in pharyngeal, which means throat. Uh, now, the muscles of our throat are arranged in two layers. There's an inner layer and an outer layer. The outer layer is thicker, and there's a thin inner layer of uh, muscle. Uh, I put uh, the thin inner layer in parentheses, in brackets, we will tell you more about the inner layer of muscles of the throat when we get to the digestive system and we examine the throat in detail. So I just want to mention the outer layer of muscle of your throat. When it contracts, it squeezes, it compresses, it narrows the throat, pushing food down the throat into the esophagus, the food tube. So when it contracts, it forces the food in, down into the esophagus, which then uh, carries the food down to the stomach. We're going to call this muscle, this outer muscle of our throat, the constrictor pharyngeus, all right? Which literally means to constrict the throat. In fact, there are many muscles of the throat. Look on page I6. So on page I6, this is the throat right here. These are the muscles of the throat. Down here, there are two tubes that uh, come off the throat and travel down your neck, right? Uh, this one, this muscular tube here, is called the esophagus. That pushes food down uh, to your stomach. This tube here is called the trachea, or a windpipe. That carries air into your lungs. This is anterior on the front side, right? Front, face side. This is posterior or back side. It's right behind it. So these, this is the outer muscles of the throat. When they contract, they push the food down the, uh, into the esophagus. We're going to call them all the constrictor pharynges. Uh, let's go back to the previous page, I-5. And on the bottom of I-5, it says the supra hyoid muscles. And the word suprahyoid literally means above the hyoid. Our first thought is, what the hell's the hyoid? Well, we learned the hyoid bone. Uh, on our Mr. Skeleton Man, the hyoid bone is this U-shaped bone right here. 
And we can feel our own hyoid bone by feel, putting our fingers right under our jaw. And if you swallow, you'll feel a U-shaped bone moving. And so in fact, these suprahyoid muscles actually are what move the hyoid bone. When you swallow, the suprahyoid muscles pull on the hyoid bone and they move it up and forward. That's what you feel happening when you swallow, is that hyoid bone is raised upwards, closer to your mandible. So these muscles originate on the mandible, insert on the hyoid bone. What does every muscle do when it shortens? It pulls the insertion towards the origin. It pulls the hyoid closer to the mandible, uh, upwards. So they elevate the hyoid bone in the base of the tongue during swallowing. They are controlled by the trigeminal nerve. We can see a picture of this uh, again on the next page on I6. It's right on the underside of the jaw, and it's called the mylohyoid muscle. And it originates on the mandible, inserts on the hyoid bone. When it contracts, it pulls the hyoid bone forward and up. And it makes it easier to swallow the food down your throat. And you'll notice I wrote down here below the picture, mylohyoid. It is one of the muscles we'll see on the cat. There's also a muscle called the digastric, but I won't ask you to know it. 